Our next guest is the former executive producer of Hockey Night in Canada, the co-host of the Bob McCallum podcast. And uh, we're lucky to have you, John Shannon, because a terrific interview you and Bob did with Canucks president of hockey operations, Jim Rutherford. Well, uh, I, I, you know, first of all, it is always great to be with Earth. Let me just say that. <laughs> it is always great to be with Earth. Um, and and it, was, it was great to be with Jimmy. Uh, as you know, Matt, I have a long relationship with Jim. Uh, going back to, I hate to admit it, but his playing days. <laughs> um, and so we've always kept in contact, whether it be in Hartford or in Carolina or Pittsburgh. And uh, when he went to Vancouver, that was a, a natural uh, succession to the conversation. And he's always been very giving of his time to Bob and me. He was, and, and I'll tell you what, just as an aside, one of the reasons he was is he used to always drive from Pittsburgh to Toronto to visit his mother. I remember these stories. <laughs> and and he turned on sports radio in Toronto and listened to Bob McCowan from four to seven on the drive home. And mm-hmm. so he's always had a soft spot for McCowan. And uh, I think that showed on uh, on the interview on, on Tuesday. What um, Have you perceived any changes in the way he communicates now that he's in a Canadian market as opposed to back in the day when he was in Pittsburgh or Raleigh? I think he understands um, the difference now. I think he understands the pressure now. Um, but I don't think that has changed any way his dealing with the media or dealing uh, with uh, the fans. I think his approach to building a hockey club is the same as it was in all of those cities. Uh, but let's just say I think he's more aware of his environment. Where do you think he's at? with building his hockey club, John, I mean, there were so many different topics that you guys hit in that interview. I guess my question to you is what stood out the most for you? Like, what are you taking away from what he had to say? Well, it was something, uh, you know, we can sit and talk about JT Miller and, you know, I I didn't even get to ask him the question, which is ancient history in Vancouver. Now is, you know, they had to make that hard decision between Horvat and Miller and they made, you know, it, it proved to be for them. They made the right one. But I, I think it was the question about Thatcher Demko. Uh, I think that when you sit and talk about, this is a, an elite goaltender. This is a, a, a Vezina nominee. But, but, can he stay healthy? And, because let me ask you, or if, if, if Demko had been healthy, would the Canucks have gone farther? And I, 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 think they, I think they might have. That's not yeah. a knock. At, that's not a knock at what the Smith did. That's not a not, certainly not a knock at what Shelovs did. But Thatcher Demko's a better goalie, and the challenge now for the organization, particularly Ian Clark, is to keep Demko healthy. And I think that that was the one thing that came out of it that they're looking at changing his practice routine. He says he worked, he practiced too hard. So from that perspective, I I think that's important. Matt and Did I- he sound worried to you, John? Uh, like, for those who missed the interview, like, uh, how did Demko come up, and uh, how worried did he sound well, about all this? Well, I, I don't, I don't I mean. Have you ever heard Jimmy worry? <laughs> honestly, honestly, yeah. I, I don't think you hear Jim Rutherford ever worried, um, and I don't think he is worried. I just think that he's very pragmatic about it. it. It came up because I asked him. I said, you know, you've got a great goaltender, but can he stay healthy? Um, and, and so, you know, he's, you know, he's going to be an American Olympian. Uh, he's going to be part of their team probably for the frozen four next year. So, you know, he's a big factor, not just for Vancouver, but for American hockey and to stay healthy. is So bloody important for all of that. And, and you, you're, well, you remember the conversations before and after in the last two years, Demko's injury. Yeah, everybody in town knew about it. Everybody, I mean, there was, it, it was deflating to know that, oh, no Demko. Oh, what are we going to do now? I mean, holy. And, and so I, I think that he, he, he talked about being cautious with him. And I, I, don't, I don't think that was worry. I just think that was him being very practical about it. On a more broad scale, you mentioned the Four Nations and what that what's going to be happening there, and obviously Thatcher Demko being a big part of that American team. Do you think that NHL teams will try, and I'm going to use Thatcher Demko as an example, but 
he's going to be a part of that team, but the workload that he's going to get when he goes there, like, is there going to be some sort of discussion with the teams and their superstar players, especially if they view themselves as cup, as cup contenders? Well, I, I don't think so because I think that, you know, it's replacing the all-star game. Uh, the effort's going to be a little higher than what we've seen at all-star games, but it's going to be comparable to what we we're going to see at the Olympics the following year. Uh, and once you put the flag on or for any of those four countries uh, next February and for how many countries are going to be in the Olympics in 26, uh, once you put, once you put the, the colors on, once you wear the flag, um, you forget about your club team for, for two <laughs> weeks. You do. You forget about your club team for two weeks and hope you don't get hurt. Uh, he spoke on Elias Pettersson as well uh, with regards to the lack of time and space in the playoffs and, and the learning. It sounded very much like he was trying to build Pettersson up after what was a, uh, let's face it, difficult postseason and then perhaps an even more difficult uh, end-of-year media session with him and talking. Wow, and, and when you consider that there seemed to be a, a little bit of a disagreement about how hurt Elias was uh, in the playoffs, um, but uh, again, I, that was, that to me, Matt, it's funny when I asked that question, I almost knew the answer <laughs> before he said it. Um, you know, he's, he's not predictable, but he's, he's, he, he'll reinforce what he needs to reinforce. Um, and, you know, Pedersen is so much a big part of what this team's going to be, not just for one year, but for eight now. Um, and you can only hope that that learning curve, uh, that Jim talked about uh, gets reinforced. Not and, and by the way, not just in the playoffs, in the regular season too. You, you look at his numbers. His numbers were more than respectable, mm -hmm. but he could, but he could be a dynamic force. And when you, I, mean, I, I think we talked about this during the playoffs, Matt. Um, when you saw what JT Miller, how he elevated his game in the playoffs, there has to be an expectation that Elias Pedersen can elevate to that level too. And, and, and so the learning curve, yes, about the tight checking and, and close quarters, but just paying attention to your teammates, I think for Pedersen might be the biggest thing when you saw what Pedersen, what, what, uh, what Miller did. I mean, uh, one game in Nashville, there were three opportunities late in the game and Miller was involved in all three and they were in three different zones of the ice. It's, I mean, that's, that's what playoff hockey's all about. And hopefully Elias will learn a little bit of that. Yeah, I think it was difficult. I think the learning experience, right? The bubble was the bubble and it was no fans and nothing like that. But you go into enemy territory such as Edmonton and obviously Nashville, things were completely different. John, tell me why Daniel Sprong is going to work here. Everywhere he's played, he seems to have worked, but he's played in a lot of places. Yes, because he has faults. Yeah. Um, he has, a, he, he has, I remember watching him play in the queue or, and he had a major league shot in the queue. He, 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 was, he was by far the best shooter in that league that year. But what I would tell you, though, is that in junior hockey, he had a bad attitude. He thought he was better than anybody else. <laughs> and, and for the first two years in the National Hockey League, um, that kind of got projected around his teammates, his teams, uh, and people got impatient with it. I, I think that he's one of those guys that you get into your mid to late 20s, you start to learn how to play the professional game, know your strengths. Um, and he, and if he can learn to play in his own zone, because by the way, if he doesn't learn to play in his own zone, he's in the press box. He's not playing. He's not playing. Yeah, right. And, and Rick Tock will ensure that. Um, but Sprong has every attribute to, to be a, a contributor particularly on, on the power play. And as you know, when we talked about last week, who's going to be on that wing, you know, Jim called him a mid forward, like a, like top, top six and, and not yeah. necessarily bottom three. I, I'm not convinced of that as much as he might be at this point, but this goes to, you know, them always trying to churn the water and finding somebody that can help the club. And I'm, you know what, there might be another guy coming. You never know. There might be somebody else that they can go and 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 say, okay, we're going to give him a chance. And and that's I think I think that's one of Alvin and Rutherford's best traits is that uh, they don't they don't stop thinking about how to make the team better.
Yeah, and which brings me to the next question, John. Um, didn't quite get the elite winger they hoped for, although Jake Dabrusk may well be that guy or a close facsimile. Um, a top four defenseman. We're all wondering now, okay, you have all these wingers. Are Is another move coming? Are they looking to package guys to see if they can land a top four defenseman? What do you think? They have their eyes on yet another big move this summer? I'm not convinced of that. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that they might take a chance with uh, all those darn condors they have on the back. Uh, and, and, and start and start the season that way and say, can our big bodies, can our big bodies be a difference maker all, around Quinn Hughes? Uh, so, so I, I'm not convinced. And with the money they spent on Veronik already, um, I, I think that uh, they might be a little more settled on the blue line than most people think. Mm. Uh, my friend, but, 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 but as you know, as you know, you know, season starts the 12th of October by the 28th of October, Mm-hmm. Patrick and Jimmy get itchy. <laughs> and they well, yeah, I was going to say, like, they, they they both seem itchy at all times. Especially uh, if they start the way they did last year again. Right. Um, Crazy. Uh, switching gears here, uh, Rick Tockett's done an interview with The Athletic where he talked about, well, yeah, he's got to come back with a fresh approach that if he asked the players to get better, better dig in, in the summer, improve areas of weaknesses that he is going to do the same thing. Um, what are your thoughts here? Because they had so much success with talk at preaching certain staples. And a lot of that was conservative hockey in terms of turning the puck over and dumping it in rather than trying to make a play to carry it in. It affected their offense somewhat, but it was also the secret of their success. How much, uh, how much uh, fiddling would you think is too much fiddling? Uh, what would be your concern level that we throw out baby? with bathwater here? Uh, I think it's all pointing to a similar topic we had about 10 minutes ago, and that was how to get more out of guys like Pedersen. And I think if Rick Tockett has to have, has to be, or is expected to be open-minded about making change, then that's the message that's being sent through the dressing room. And that all those guys there, and there are certain guys, you know, that will always give you everything, everything. Um, and there are going to be those guys that they are, you know, in their end of season meetings, they said, you know what, here's what we need out of you next year. Here's how better you have to be. Um, and we want you to be part of the, the future here. And I, I just think what Rick said in the article, which was a really, a really good interview. Um, I, I just thought he was saying what was the obvious thing in order to try to get a message to all the, all the team, keep an open mind, be flexible. We, 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 we're going to have to learn to play hockey more than one way. And that's an important thing. Uh, lastly, John, there's a new general manager in Edmonton where ex Blackhawks GM Stan Bowman gets yeah. the post to work with Jeff Jackson. Uh, many, many here are critical of this move, not believing that Bowman deserves another chance after being a party to the cover up of the sexual abuse scandal with the Blackhawks. What are your thoughts on all this? Well, I, I had a, I, I did have a conversation with Jeff uh, seven or ten days ago about this. Um, his attitude was that um, in looking for a manager, um, he was he was told that Stan Bowman is eligible to work, and if and if you take, and I know it's difficult to do, if you take the Kyle Beach episode or problem or issue or controversy out of the picture in Chicago. What kind of job did Stan Bowman do? Um, and then if you say, well, he was a good general manager, and, and, and that's step one. Step two is you, you have to ask, do people deserve second chances? Do people uh, have the, and has Stan Bowman paid enough of a price? Has he been punished enough, you know, emotionally, financially, career-wise, to, be, to sit out for three years? Uh, has he paid enough of a price uh, and hopefully has been rehabilitated? And I, I say that after listening to Sheldon Kennedy talk about it. So I, I'm a, I've always been a believer in second chances. I've had about 12. <laughs> um, and I, I think that Stan Bowman deserves a second chance. Um, then there's also the question, is he the best person for the job? Well, that, this... that, see, that's it. That, that, that's... well they got to win. <laughs> 
they got to, it, and and so then you wonder is what is the job description? I, I and I, I made no bones about it. I thought Mark Hunter would be a better guy. I thought Mark Hunter was the guy because of his background and play development and his and the and the way the the organizational structure at Edmonton might work with Jeff Jackson being so hands on as the president. Did yeah. it make sense then to go find somebody who could be an evaluator? They already have a really good capologist. They already have a really good assistant general manager. You know, Keith Gretzky and, and Bill Scott can manage a lot of the, the paperwork. I, I, I assume Stan will learn and understand that. <clears throat> but in the end, um, Jeff, he made no bones about it. He said, you know, Stan Bowman is cleared to, to work and he's got a great resume. Mm. And hopefully... Um, hopefully people will be uh, as, as difficult as it may be. And it's a difficult discussion to have. Hopefully people will understand what Stan has gone through over the last three years as well. Uh, great stuff, John. We thank you for the time here today. Fantastic interview with Rutherford. We uh, deeply enjoyed. Catch up soon, my friend. Nice and as I said, it's always great. Always great to work with her. <laughs> with her. Thanks, buddy. Ditto. I concur. <laughs> Hey, everybody, if you're enjoying what you're seeing here, then follow along with Secure Some Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. They call it, the kids call it subscribe on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now.